Phil Simon, thank you for joining me today on Tartlecast. You wrote quite a fantastic book, Reimagining Collaboration. And one of the major points about this is that remote work was already up on the rise. Uh, disparate teams, disparate systems, and then finding a way to bring those things together so that we can continue to be just as agile and just as productive within organizations itself. And it's not just COVID that was the spur of this, the fact that it was happening before, but COVID acted as a catalyst, allowing people to actually take on those full shifts over into these new systems and start to bring them together to adopt them, to make their companies more robust. I think you put together a fantastic narrative from start to finish for how we look at the old regimes, carry over to the new ones, and then adopt this hub and spoke model which you have designed. Is that pretty much where I'm at for the general narrative for how that occurred? Yeah, well, thank you for the kind words. Um, I agree with you. I mean, if you look at remote work, people have been doing it for a very long time, even before the web or the internet, right? If you watch an episode of Mad Men, Don Draper, yeah. I think it was in season six or season seven, had his secretary, Dawn, uh, bring over work for him, even though technically he got <laughs> suspended from the company and blah, blah, blah. So it, the idea that remote work is new is, of course, false. But you're right, much like with e-commerce or telemedicine or uh, some of the other nascent trends, uh, the, the pandemic accentuated them or accelerated them. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Lenin, sometimes weeks happen in decades, sometimes decades happen in weeks. So we saw this happen with remote work. And to your point, I did not see that going back. If you look at any of the surveys or polls, uh, anywhere from you know, 30 to 50% of employees will quit if they don't get the option to work, if not fully remote, then in a hybrid capacity. So I didn't think that we were going back. And I wrote the book in part because having written both Slack for Dummies and Zoom for Dummies, it was evident to me that people were just really taking advantage of a small part of the functionality. They were using Zoom as Skype 2.0 or Microsoft Teams or Slack as email 2.0. And when you start to think about the power of those internal collaboration hubs in and of themselves, they were robust throw in these third party apps, which you correctly call spokes, and you create this gestalt that I think serves a number of different purposes and will transcend whatever return to work plans companies have in place. So I'm pretty proud of it. You say uh, gestalt and gestalt's a German word in certain forms of psychoanalysis. Why, can you just tell me why you chose that? Cause it did stick out to me in the book itself before I get into the other aspects. Yeah, um, it's uh, what was it, what's with that? <laughs> I just showing off my education, I suppose. But no, I, I like that word because it represents this holistic entity. And mm -hmm. I think one of the issues I've certainly experienced, and even I was reading um, a survey from, I think it was Wall Street Journal, or anyway, there's an article that 41% of US employees believe that there's too much workplace tech. And I would argue some of that stems from the fact that they're using these tools in a very disparate fashion. And if you mm -hmm. thought of them in a more holistic way, and you thought about it in terms of this gestalt or this, this, this cohesive entity, then people would be less overwhelmed. They'd think, wow, I, I don't need to get an email from a document signature service like DocuSign because we've got Slack and there's a Slack app for that. And I'll get my notification right in that. That doesn't mean that I won't use Microsoft Excel or Word or PowerPoint or Salesforce or Workday, but those elements would all cohere in a way that they currently aren't. Plus the other benefit is that you, by writing a conceptual book, unlike Slack for Dummies and Zoom for Dummies, I wasn't as reliant upon the latest release. I'm old enough to remember when companies shipped software updates every couple of years in a box. And, and now you look at your phone or your app and there's a red badge, you've got 16 new updates. I mean, there are, I think Amazon pushes updates something like two to 3,000 times per day. Right, right, right. But so, you, you know, and you know, talking about the updates and stuff like that, we, the world is becoming decentralized, especially with applications. And with these updates and the onset of people adapting their systems with more data to make them more robust, what we found is that, that everybody's got their own tool, everybody has their niche nuance. And as it becomes more decentralized, it's funny that we take on a hub and spoke model to centralize the internal corporate or organizational effort to collect decentralized systems and bring them together to create 
our own bespoke system for specifically what the company needs. And I think the interesting part about that is we're not stuck with, you know, here's my choice. I have Microsoft, right? Or I have, you know, this Fortran if I'm going way back in the day. Now I have tens of thousands of companies, competitors. Yes, they do get adopted and swallowed up, but from APIs, web books, and software development kits, I have the ability to actually choose, and it's almost like I'm writing the code for my organization, and that's how I look at it. So if I know what works best for us, our workflows, our culture, I can adopt that and bring it into our centralized operational hub. And that's how I've been viewing this internal thing. And I put a benchmark on to say, okay, let's look at the algorithms, the processing power, the data output of these tools and their efficiency. Does it align with us? Okay, that checks the box. Let's bring that into our organizational model. And so before I'd even read your book, that's the thing I had adopted. But I realized that what you're saying is that many other people are also applying that sort of collaboration effort across multiple platforms to create new types of remote organizations. Yeah, many people are, but I'd still argue that a very small percentage of organizations think about collaboration the way that I do, right? They, again, they might use Slack for a, this weird development group, right? Yeah. And there's the example in the book of a company called OfferUp that was right. using Slack in pockets. And once they went all in on the HubSpoke model, they, they didn't call it that, but effectively they said, we're going to eliminate email for internal communication. Let's look at apps and see how we get more out of them. Then yes, they can create something that works for them. But I, again, having had many difficult discussions with clients and prospects and colleagues, getting them to ch change their entrenched work habits has not been easy. So to me, this is, a holistic book. It's not just about what these things can do. Uh, in part three of the book, I talk about getting this to happen and it gets a little bit HRE, uh, which is a strange coming from a guy who has this tech brand, but I actually did work in HR a million years ago. And it's to me essential that an organization rewards collaborative employees, that it develops a performance management system that makes sense, that you can't just pick and choose, oh, well, so-and-so isn't collaborative and she just used Teams and he's just quirky with email. No, right. um, as you said, there's a network effect that takes place, right? I mean, Facebook is infinitely, I shouldn't say that, but much, much more valuable than Twitter because they're just more members, right? And if only one department in an organization or one group uses Slack, Teams, Zoom, whatever, then you're not building that comprehensive knowledge base. You're not instilling the culture. You're not consolidating all your data in such a way that people could look for it in one place and find it versus, oh, well, he uses Dropbox and he uses Slack and he uses OneDrive and he has it as an email attachment and that employee leaves the company and where the hell did all of that correspondence go? Right. You know, it's, you, you talked about culture and I know, Phil, you did a bunch of work in Eastern Europe with many teams. Latin America. Latin America, sorry, Latin America. Now, I, that's why I was talking about culture. Latin America has an extremely rich culture. Like when you go there, you feel it. You feel the food, you feel the people, the way they talk, the way they operate. And then you come to the United States or you come to the Western parts of Europe. And it's like, uh, we've amalgamized all these things together. And this is how we define our culture. It's very hard to get them to move and shift their ideas. How have you found, or what cultural differences is between Latin America and the United States? And have you found that adoption of hub and spoke models right? We're having, you know, a certain subset of flexibility where this culture can look at their own gestalt, as you would call it, and say, we're willing to adapt to these new things. Or you can look at more entrenched gestalts that people have created, like in the United States, to say, well, we're going to take a conservative orthodox approach, and it's going to take a lot more data to convince us and everyone in the organization to move over. Yeah, at the risk of giving Alexander the stock consulting response, it depends. <laughs> I'm doing some work now with the company in Brazil around a course that I'm developing. And when I resisted the back and forth over email, I asked if we could use Zoom. And a woman had said, well, um, we've got Microsoft Teams. Is that okay? And I said, that's fine. I just won't do it via email. Um, I guarantee you that Slack's got a decent level of penetration in the tech sector, right? Because some of it, I think you can cut this by a number of different dimensions. So you've got industry, you've got age, right? You've got type of job, you've got type of organization. So I haven't seen any data and I wouldn't want to comment without having done a little bit of analysis. 
But I would imagine that the same forces that resist change exist to different extents all over the globe. And I would also imagine that if you're a developer in the Ukraine, right, you just get Slack, right? You're not going to send email attachments back and forth. You're going to say, oh, what does this do? And in fact, you might say, wow, this is actually kind of um, <laughs> beneath me in a way, because the, the real techies might say, oh, cool, I'll write a little app or bot that does this. Whereas with the, the hubs and spokes I write in the book, you can take advantage of the integration if you can click a mouse, right? Or you can use the connectors, right? the, the tissue like Zapier or Workado or Workado, I never pronounced that right. <laughs> or some of the other air slates, another one uh, that allow you to effectively create a bridge between, let's say that you use Basecamp for project management and you use Zoom for your hub. Well, last time I checked, there was no Basecamp app for Zoom, but there is a zap for that. So effectively, with a couple of clicks, you can do the same thing. So if someone responds to your comment or pings you or does whatever in Basecamp, you can get that notification in Zoom as opposed to an email. Right. You know, and it's that sort of flexibility. Is it it's just a function of awareness? What is typically the catalyst that gets people to make that change? Do you have to be like, hey, push and push and push? Can you try it? Can you at least try it? Can I show you what the efficiencies are and you can compare it to how it was in the beginning? Like, how do you show them that line of data to say this is in fact helping you and your organization. And I could write a book about that question. <laughs> uh, so let's start with the elephant in the room. There's nothing like forced adoption, right? When it became evident that we weren't going to right. be going back to our offices in a couple of weeks, people said, all right, we, we can't do this via email. So that's why Zoom users went from 10 million primarily enterprise folks at the end of 2019 to 200 million primarily consumers in it was March of 2020, and then 300 million in April of 2020. So we had this recognition that we needed something that worked. With regard to Microsoft Teams, Microsoft, as you know, bundles it with Office 365 or Office Live, whatever they're calling it these days. So you don't have to pay for it. You might say, all right, fine, let's give this a shot. So forced adoption is enormous. But again, Teams, Slack, Zoom had plenty of users, millions, in fact, before the pandemic. So there were folks that recognized, to your point, that there was a better way of working. All the benefits of just Slack and Zoom and Teams by themselves, let alone connecting them to the different spokes. Um, as for the folks in the middle, um, those are some of the trickiest folks, but at least they're open to it. And you're right, sometimes just showing them how did you know that it's actually pretty easy to learn because if you're of a certain age, you remember AOL instant messaging tools like AIM, right? Or Skype, and you kind of get what the at symbol does. You kind of get what the hashtag does. You use Facebook, you use LinkedIn. So in some of the training that I do, I try to convince folks that it's not like you're learning a, a new programming language, right? And you haven't coded in 20 years. Um, you know, my, my friend Chris is a professor at Arizona State University where I used to teach. And when they told him we're moving away from JavaScript to Python, he said, give me three days and I'll know it because they're so similar. Right. Um, so uh, you try to take advantage of those cues, right? The, the, the familiar, familiarity, that way it's less about learning an entirely new system of doing things and saying, okay, this has its quirks, right? And I use all of them, right? I use <laughs> Teams, I use Zoom, I use Google Workspace, I use Slack. And yeah, sometimes it's tough to remember it, but pretty much the at symbol or the hashtag does the same thing. And they've all got channels. You can make them public. You can make them private. You can invite people to them. You can ban people from them. You could set up different notifications for each one. So to me, they have more in common. And that's not coincidental, right? I mean, if you look at the history of technology, vendors consistently steal from each other, right? Whether it's Facebook saying, oh yeah, we like Snap Stories or in the ERP world, the different vendors saying, oh, what are you guys doing in, with Windows? I look at some of the enhancements that they've made with Windows 10 and soon to be Windows 11, and they feel very Mac-oriented. Um, and Apple has also taken things from Android for iOS. So yeah, these things are really converging. That's why I try to make the point in the book that, yeah, there may be temporary benefits for one hub or one spoke versus another, but unless it's something that's essential, you know, pick a lane and go with it. Yeah. And so then it's not really so much as if one individual spoke is more important than the rest. It's really about having your combination of spokes that create the robustness of your hub. And if the hub is robust, then they can all speak to one another efficiently. And, and you, you've used examples of Slack 
and we use Slack at Tarnal, and we've integrated all of our other workflow applications with it, from server notifications to ticket production, post production. We have it for our emails, DocuSign, whatever it is you need. Where were you a year ago? I would have featured you in the book. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Well, that's that's what people have been wondering. We've been around for five years. We've grown to 222 countries, but you know, people are just slow to listen. They're slow to adopt. And I understand that it's a process. And when I read your book, I'm like, I know for a fact that your methodology works. It's 100%. Yeah, it's absolutely efficient. I'm not doing this to float your ego here, Phil. I float really away, baby. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but in, in all seriousness, it does work. And uh, talking to you, I can share as a testament to the hub and spoke model that you speak of great artists do steal. And if you can combine many things to create something new, there's nothing wrong with doing it, but it creates robust, efficient organizations that can do more quicker. It's frankly, it's a function of communication across different mediums. And it's like, how do we aggregate that communication? I, I couldn't agree more. And then when I really geek out in chapter, I think it's 15, think about the future of collaboration and how it's going to right. look a lot like that movie, Her, with Spike Jones falling, I'm sorry, the Spike Great. Jones movie with them. Joaquin Phoenix falling in love with the operating system. Because again, if you're keeping, and I'm no expert on AI and machine learning, but I do know this, all of those things are based on data. So if you get the HubSpoke model today and start implementing it, you'll have more data versus a company that gets it in five years and say, fine, we get it. So I would argue that the time to act is now. And no, it won't be perfect, but the idea that it, email is urgent because someone put urgent in the subject title, right, is insane, <laughs> right? Something could be urgent beyond that, right? So what makes something urgent? Again, I don't have the answer to that. It's kind of a, an existential question, but if you've got a bunch of data, then in theory, you could answer that type of question. And just, again, if I've got two companies, identical industries, management, profit margins, whatever, company A has adopted the HubSpoke model collaboration and company B hasn't, with no other information, I'll bet on company A any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Well, listen, I hope you bet on us because, uh... You know, we're doing we're doing big things. And if it wasn't for having all these back end tools brought together, like you speak of, we'd be in a rock and a hard place trying to figure stuff out. And the communication, if it works, you guys sing like canaries, but if it doesn't, it kills it kills collaboration, it kills organizations, and it just pretty much kills any workload you ever try to do. So yeah. Phil, I uh, I really do appreciate you coming on to talk about this. And if there's one thing I'd like to ask, what is it? you would like to leave as a final note for our listeners and this would be lay people across many different countries and also many fortune 500 executives yeah start early uh, when it comes to building a collaborative culture and embracing hubs and spokes you have this opportunity when you hire folks and now a lot of people are leaving their jobs right for lots of different reasons um, i try to explain to folks if collaboration is so important then start by getting off of email right and invite someone to be a guest in Teams, Slack, whatever, and correspond with that person. So when you're doing the interview, you can ask the person, are you collaborative, right? <laughs> Again, that's a bit insane because who's going to say, no, I'm a real so-and-so, right? But you could observe if the person says, well, look, you know, I, I don't use Slack or Teams or I'm not open to using technology. You still may want to hire that person, but you got a pretty valuable data point that this person doesn't embrace new tools. And again, if you're the type of organization that says, oh, use whatever tools you want, then that may be okay. But I mean, you're a testament, um, Alexander, to the benefit of getting everyone internally using this and how if you are, and I was just um, corresponding with Darren Murph, not to name drop, he's going to be on my podcast. And he's the head of remote work at GitHub. He's gotten a lot of press lately. I think there's a 14,000 or something page document that he's open sourced um, that shows how they do remote work. Right. And when we were going back and forth and I had him sign up for my pod, I sent him a link to my schedule and a link to a Google form in one Google doc. And it was very much self-service. And he came back with, dude, you are so far ahead of the game because it did not take 16 messages back and forth and you forgot to fill out this. So this notion of self-service, right? Assume, and, and I love in the company's documentation, assume that someone has asked your question before. You're a new hire, right? How do I get benefits? How do I get my laptop? Guess what? You're not the only person to have that. 
So when you think right. about collaboration, it isn't simply a matter of working with someone to get an answer sooner. Um, although that's a big part of it. I would argue that there's a qualitative aspect to it, right? Why do I want to involve you to say, oh, you need to go to this FAQ, right? Couldn't we communicate better? And then the work that you're actually doing isn't something that could be automated. Uh, Kevin Roos, who wrote a, a really good book called Future Proof, was on my podcast. And the, the rule that I forget is don't be an endpoint. So if your job is to be almost a human API, right? Or say you're an Uber driver, you take someone from point A to point B. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but there are companies, as you know, that are working on autonomous driving. So that in theory, isn't a growth job in the future. So no. if your job involves doing that type of thing, think about how you could change that. So eventually, you know, and not in my lifetime, you're not gonna see AI or machine learning do some of the things that I think people enjoy doing, right? Creating a book or creating a new product. Yeah, no, and I, uh, I agree. And, you know, most of the jobs around the world, this sounds horrendous, 95% of them are for moving information from point A to point B or a physical object from point A to point B. And only 5% of the world employed are ones that are actually doing something that effectuates other things where they're not acting as an endpoint. They're the ones actually driving the change, you know, creating you know, very, you know, these autonomous vehicles, things of that nature. And I think um, we need to be aware of that. And if you don't want your company to be an endpoint, well, then you should reimagine how you should collaborate. And I think that would be my final cue on that. I can't say it any better than that. Thanks for having me on, Alex. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate it.